Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, at this time, just a friendly reminder to please silence or turn off your cell phones to avoid any disruptions during the presentation tonight. Thank you. Um, so my name is Heath. Um, I'm the adult services librarian here at the library. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's sustainability series program. Um, our thanks to uh, Progress Norwood and Together Yes for partnering with us on the series and to Norwood Community Media for coming and recording this for us. Um, our presenter tonight is Mark Richardson, Director of Horticulture for New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill. Uh, he helped lead recent garden-wide construction efforts, including the building of the Ramble, which is the garden's recently opened family garden. Mark served previously as Botanic Garden Director for the Native Plant Trust, where he oversaw a Garden in the Woods and the Sami Farm Native Plant Nursery. He has a passion for ecological horticulture and native plants and is the co-author of the book, Native Plants for New England Gardens. And please welcome him here today. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it was you know, not, a, not a bad drive down here, I'll say, from Boylston. It took me about an hour, maybe a little bit more than an hour with this traffic that I hit right at the tail end, but uh, really not bad. So I highly encourage uh, you to get out to visit us at New England Botanic Garden. We were formerly Tower Hill Botanic Garden. We changed our name last year to try to reflect the regional resource that we've, uh, we've really become. Um, so we, we still have Tower Hill in the name, um, but we're now New England Botanic Garden. Just quick show of hands, how many of you have been out to Tower Hill in the past? All right, great, great. Well, please, please come see us. We had, a, uh, we had a banner weekend this past weekend. I highly suggest not coming on Mother's Day. Uh, it's just not a day you want to be in a botanic garden um, because so many other people do. So definitely a day to avoid. But yeah, uh, we're in Boylston, so just uh, just outside of Worcester. Um, and honestly, it was all highway here. It was really quick and easy. So um, definitely suggest coming to, coming to check us out. This is not Tower Hill, um, but the the uh, the program that you've come to tonight is called Kill Your Lawn. Uh, back. Many years ago when I first started uh, developing this idea and developing this program, um, I, was, I, was, uh, I was told that I was crazy for trying to encourage people to kill their lawns. Um, but every time I give this lecture, um, it's usually a sellout. It's usually the most they've ever had in their uh, lecture hall. It's, uh, it's one that people really enjoy hearing about, whether they're on my side or on the other side. Uh, they want to hear what I have to say. Um, so that's sort of the point, is to get everybody together to uh, talk about this topic and, and talk about why it's important. Um, so a little bit about me before we dive into the meat of the topic, or uh, meat of the subject matter tonight. Um, so this is a, a picture of the view at New England Botanic Garden in Tower Hill. Um, just off to the right in this image, uh, a little bit out of reach, um, is Mount Wachusett. So we have a beautiful view of Mount Wachusett. That's actually Wachusett Reservoir um, that you're seeing there. And the name Tower Hill um, comes from the 1930s when the town of West Boylston was flooded uh, under the reservoir. Um, West Boylston's still upset about that. Um, but the, uh, the, the, tower t the name Tower Hill comes from the fact that there was a surveyor's tower set up on part of the property um, that they used to actually survey the, the reservoir. Um, so it, it has a long history, and it was Tower Hill Farm before the Worcester County Horticultural Society, which is the organization I work for, uh, purchased the property in 1983. Um, we're uh, almost 200 acres of lovely botanic garden. Um, we have thousands and thousands of spring blooms right now, tons of daffodils. Um, we have a, a nearly one acre daffodil field that blooms uh, right around Earth Day is about the perfect day to come and check it out um, with tens of thousands of daffodils all in bloom at the same time. Uh, we planted 100,000 bulbs last fall. Uh, most, most falls we plant um, somewhere close to that number of bulbs. Um, the garden's beautiful any time of year, but certainly in the spring. Um, spring is definitely the be best time, in my mind, uh, the best time to come and visit, so long as you avoid the crowds on Mother's Day. Um, before I joined, uh, as Heath mentioned, before I joined the staff at New England Botanic Garden at Tower Hill, I worked for an organization that's now called the Native Plant Trust. Um, back when I worked for them, they were New England Wildflower Society. Um, and the Native Plant Trust is focused on um, plant conservation. So they're a region-wide plant conservation organization. Um, 
I know most people are familiar with endangered species, endangered plant species, and think of them as you know plant species from the tropics, um, plant species from uh, you know tropical rainforests and and the like. But we have a lot of really rare species in our uh, in our backyards. Um, so what Native Plant Trust does is a lot of great conservation work. They work with regional partners all throughout uh, the six New England states. Um, they collect seed from. Um, uh, uh, imperiled plant populations and they bank that seed. So uh, if you've ever had an interest in uh, learning more about how you can play a role in plant conservation, the Native Plant Trust is definitely a great organization to check out um, and go look at. They do a lot of really important work. Um, and their botanic garden, Garden in the Woods, is also uh, at peak bloom right now and I'd highly suggest a visit um, in mid-May. Um, there, their crowds are a little bit less than ours, so I would definitely recommend a Mother's Day visit. Um, sometime around Mother's Day is the, the ideal time to go and visit the uh, Garden in the Woods. Um, so this is uh, an editorial that was uh, in the Washington Post back a number of years ago now. Um, and I think it captures pretty perfectly how I feel about the typical American lawn. Um, I'm just going to read it off to you. So it's lawns are a soul crushing time suck and most of us would be better off without them. Um, we invest a lot of time and a lot of resources in maintaining our pristine and perfectly manicured lawns um, for very little value. There's very little um, ecological value in a lawn. Uh, there's really very little um, aesthetic value in my mind in a lawn. Um, and uh, there's a lot more we could be doing with those green spaces um, than acres and acres and acres of lawn. And hopefully I can convince you of that this, this evening as we, uh, as we make our way through the program. Uh, but first I want to set the stage a little bit um, and kind of you know, hammer home the obsession that we as Americans typically have with, with our lawns. Um, we're all aspiring to be you know, the perfect ideal American landscape. And I think many people really look at something like this as the perfect ideal American landscape. Um, to me, it's pretty boring. Uh, there's not a lot of color in this image, including the house. Um, but there's not a lot of color in this image whatsoever, right? You've got this one little strip of, of red here with some uh, salvia, maybe some, uh, uh, you know, some, some yews in the background, also perfectly manicured. Um, and to me, this just doesn't really scream a place I want to visit. Uh, no matter who's in the White House, this does not scream a place I want to visit uh, because it's just kind of boring and a little sterile and a little drab. Um, and I think there's a lot more we could be doing with our, with our green spaces than, uh, than growing lawns and evergreen shrubs. Uh, and hopefully tonight I can convince you of that. We spend a lot on maintaining lawns. Uh, this is, anybody recognize this image? This is uh, something you should all probably recognize. This is the National Mall. Um, so this is the National Mall um, back about 10 years ago now. Uh, I used to work near DC. I worked for a garden called Brookside Gardens, which is just north of uh, Washington, Washington DC. I got to spend a lot of time on the National Mall, um, as do a lot of people, and that's why the mall uh, really looked the way that it did. Uh, there was uh, Congress every single year put in money in the budget for restoring the National Mall. Every single year it got cut. Uh, and so this, this went on for decades and decades um, before finally a lot of uh, good nonprofit organizations uh, led a fundraising effort um, led by the Trust for the National Mall um, to restore it. And so uh, over the course of several years, um, they invested uh, almost a billion dollars, so $852 million um, in restoring the grass on the National Mall. Um, there was 20 acres of grass altogether. Um, they uh, removed and replaced all of the soil um, to a pretty decent depth uh, because if you know anything about turf grass, it really doesn't like compaction. And what you saw in that image was uh, uh, turf grass that was really loved to death. Uh, with a lot of events every day on the mall, with a lot of protests on the mall, um, with uh, inaugurations and uh, concerts and everything else, uh, the National Mall's turf was really loved to death. Um, and so all that soil was, was pretty far gone and had to be restored. Um, they made a lot of great uh, sustainability choices as they restored the mall. Um, for example, uh, they put in irrigation and they put in drainage, but they also captured a lot of the stormwater that landed on the buildings and the asphalt around the mall um, so that they could use that for irrigation. So there's a 250,000 gallon cistern that was installed as part of this. A cistern is just a below ground storage reservoir um, that you can tap for irrigation. So they were capturing stormwater 
be able to use that for watering the grass, which is, which is great. It's a sustainability uh, effort, and that was really good. They also used uh, a, a, a really uh, unique um, specification for the soil that they installed, very well draining, tolerant of compaction, um, and they spent a lot of time focusing on the, the species that they would use, the grass species they would use to make sure that the, uh, the turf would hold up um, to the abuse that they knew it was going to get. This was a major construction effort. Uh, the Trust for the National Mall um, does a lot of great work uh, on national monuments, and they still have earth cams. Uh, you can go today and check out an earth cam, a view from the Washington Monument, and see what's going on in Washington, D.C. Um, so they recorded the whole entire process um, with, with cameras that were high up, uh, high up in some of the Smithsonian buildings. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, this was the result. Um, to me, this is America's front yard, right? Um, but still, pretty boring. Uh, you know, I know that the, 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 the I'll say the uh, persons who mow the lawn um, take great pride in that striping, uh, but you know, that just doesn't have much appeal for me. Uh, this is not the landscape that I'm really looking for. Um, this is a perfect example of you know, us showing our power over uh, nature. Uh, you know, Washington, D.C. was a swamp. Uh, we, built, we built the nation's capital, uh, some would say almost the world's capital, in a swamp, um, and uh, put in a giant lawn for the National Mall uh, and restored it to the tune of $852 million. It's money that could have, I think, been well, uh, really well spent um, someplace else. Um, so I use that just to kind of paint the picture that we spend an awful lot of money, an awful lot of time, an awful lot of resources um, to maintain these uh, green spaces um, that in the National Mall's case actually get a lot of use, um, but if we're honest with ourselves about how much we use uh, the acres of grass we have in a lot of our uh, landscape, it gets very little use. Um, you know, I, I drive by a, a million houses uh, on my way to and from work uh, where they've got the two-car garage, the pristine lawn that's cared for by the uh, lawn company, they park in the garage, they go indoors, uh, they come back outside in the morning when they're uh, on their way to work, they spend very little time on their, on their grass, and for good reason, because it's toxic, uh, and it's probably <laughs> gonna poison them anyway. Um, so we'll get into that in a little bit as well. Um, so here's the outline for this evening. Uh, what's so bad about my lawn? Uh, why am I harping on this issue? Why is this an issue at all? Um, hopefully I've convinced you that your lawn uh, really needs to be managed differently. Um, okay, I get it, but how can I sustainably rid myself of lawn if, you've, if, I've, if I've brought you that far? And then finally, oh, my lawn's gone, now what? Uh, and that's, that's where we'll get into a little bit about some of the plants that I really like to use as lawn, lawn replacements. Sound good? Yeah. Any questions up to this point? Okay. All right, so first I think it's important that we talk a little bit about what, what I really mean by a lawn. Um, I have what many people might consider a lawn at home. I have about an acre. I live in a town called Uxbridge. Um, most of the house lots are about an acre. I back up to wetlands, which I really enjoy and appreciate. Um, so I'm very careful about what I do around my house because I don't want to have a negative impact on the wetlands. Uh, but my neighbors don't always feel the same way. Um, and, uh, and, you know, for me, I'm perfectly happy to have a lot of weeds in my lawn. Um, and so my lawn is a very different type of lawn. I have three kids. Uh, we've got a trampoline. We have a pool. My older sons play soccer. You know, that recreation space is really important. We really use it. Um, but for a lot of my neighbors and a lot of people uh, in, in, in the U.S., um, that lawn ends up not being used because a lot of people don't want to walk in the grass. They don't want to damage it. Um, it's funny, uh, working in a botanic garden, um, we're always really cognizant of the fact that people have no problem stepping on mulch landscape beds. Uh, people have no problem stepping across uh, newly planted perennial borders, um, but they will not walk on your lawn. Uh, and that's just ingrained in us as a culture. Uh, you can't step on the grass. We always have to put signs out that say, please step on the grass, uh, because otherwise people won't. But this is what we're really here to talk about this evening. So a lawn is a monoculture of cool season turf grasses, mostly native to Europe. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, about why that's important in a second. Um, lawns can be important recreation space. So I mentioned that I have kids that play soccer. Um, one of my favorite lawn alternatives is wild strawberry. You'll see a picture of wild strawberry a little bit later on. I 
I'm telling you now, you can't play soccer on wild strawberry. Uh, it just doesn't work well. Um, but uh, there are a lot of other uh, turf grass alter alternatives um, that, uh, that are perfectly fine in places where we want an emerald green carpet, um, but don't really need to play uh, sports on them. Um, so lawn is important recreation space, and there's definitely a place for it. Uh, I always want to make sure to recommend, uh, recognize that. Um, turf grasses are able to withstand repeated um, foot traffic. Uh, they're tolerant of some compaction, um, and they have this brilliant ability to be able to grow after you've mown them down, um, that where a lot of other plants cannot do that. Um, there's about 40 million acres of lawns across the U.S. Uh, that represents nearly 2% of the total uh, land mass in the U.S. Uh, so that's a, that's a pretty big number. Um, all told, and this number is quite a bit older now. I'm sure this, uh, with some updating, it's a little bit higher. We spend about $40 billion a year uh, on lawn care in this country. Um, it used to be when I gave this talk, I would talk about how the U.S. as a country spends about $40 billion a year on foreign aid. Um, I think that number has actually gone down um, since I uh, first looked up that statistic, so I can't really say that any longer. Uh, but just to put it into some perspective, we spend about the same amount on lawn care that we uh, have spent in years past on, on uh, aid to other, other countries. Um, and then uh, on the slide, I just love this Michael Pollan quote uh, because, again, it sums up pretty well how I feel about lawns. The lawn is nature under totalitarian rule, uh, and I think there's a better way to garden. Um, than, than trying to maintain that pristine lawn. Um, so what's so bad about my lawn? Well, first let's talk about water for a minute. Um, in the Northeast, uh, we have periods of drought and periods of, uh, of, of moist soils, or sorry, periods of uh, 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 plenty of rainfall. Um, as I mentioned before, most turf grass species are native to Europe. Um, if, you visit, uh, if you visit England in July, for example, there's still getting lots of rain in July. Uh, it's a very different climate from the climate that we have here. Um, and as a result, the native species that evolved over thousands of years to grow in this climate um, know that at summer we've got to go kind of dormant, uh, slow down, or find other ways of photosynthesizing so that we can stay green. Um, turf grass species that are European don't really recognize that, and so we try to prop them up artificially with, uh, with irrigation. Um, and uh, across the country, about 60% of our potable water goes down on uh, lawn irrigation in the uh, arid southwest. Here in the northeast, that number is about 30%. So about a third of the water that goes through uh, treatment plants and goes through pipes in the ground um, to be delivered to your home, um, about 30% of that water that's cleansed, that's suitable for drinking, um, goes out uh, on, on, uh, to the landscape for, for watering lawns. Um, and as you travel farther and farther west, where water, water resources are much more scarce, that number grows up to as much as 60% um, in the southwest of the country. Um, this is really only necessary because turf grass is not adapted to our climate, and certainly not adapted to places like Arizona, uh, where that number is pretty high. Um, lawns really require pesticides for perfection, um, and even not so much for perfection. Um, pesticides are you know, fungicides, insecticides, and herbicides. Uh, herbicides are what you apply to kill a plant that you don't necessarily want. Uh, fungicides are to take care of um, fungal pathogens that might be impacting whatever plant it is that you're trying to grow. Um, and um, uh, insecticides are for attacking uh, insects that might be feeding on plants. Um, they all fall under the classification of pesticides. Um, and for maintaining that perfect lawn, you really can't do it without applying some pesticides. Um, and it's, it's really impossible to, uh, to maintain a perfect lawn without some pesticides. In fact, in the U.S., we spread about 30,000 tons of pesticides annually on our lawns. That's a really big number um, and a little bit hard to put into context. So uh, I like this, this breakdown that we have here is uh, for the typical lawn service in Massachusetts. Um, you know, this is the company that you're hiring to perform services in your landscape. Um, they're putting down the equivalent of about, of about five to seven pounds per acre of pesticides on your lawn every year. Um, most people recognize that to grow sweet corn, we have to use a lot of pesticides. I used to grow sweet corn, and every time we had a thunderstorm roll in, we had to go out and spray insecticides for, uh, for um, European corn borer. Um, and it, it, uh, sweet corn definitely gets a lot of pesticides applied to it. Um, we're applying two, two to three times as much 
um, uh, as many pesticides on turf grass as we are on sweet corn. Now, I don't know how you all feel about uh, pesticides. I'm generally okay with pesticide usage for um, feeding people. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any way we can feed 9 billion people on the planet without using some pesticides. Um, but that's the limit of my, uh, uh, um, my tolerance of pesticide usage. Um, I don't see any reason that we need to use pesticides for ornamental landscapes. Uh, so this number really drives me bad. Well, I'll say crazy. Um, and so again, this is only necessary because turf grasses are not adapted to our climate and we're really trying to uh, make them look perfect. Um, I know a lot of times people don't get hung up on uh, herbicides, don't get hung up on the, uh, you know, seeing those little yellow um, placards in the corner of a lawn after it's had some pesticides applied to it. Um, but uh, if you start to really dig into the health effects of really commonly available and commonly used pesticides, um, they're substantial and they're severe. So this is a, um, a chart that's published by Beyond Pesticides. Um, and it shows that very common herbicide 2,4-D uh, 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 causes cancer, it's a carcinogen, uh, it's an endocrine disruptor, it causes reproductive uh, defects, it's a neurotoxin, causes kidney and liver damage, um, uh, irritates your skin, and causes birth defects. Uh, and there are a lot of other um, pesticides that are much stronger than the ones on this list, uh, or just uh, the ones on the list, this list in general that cause human health impacts and things that we should be really cautious and working around and we certainly shouldn't be letting our kids and our pets roll around on grass after it's been treated with pesticides. Um, also fertilizers. So uh, I always like to say that no matter if a fertilizer is organic or synthetic, it's still a, a pollutant. Um, the minute you apply a fertilizer, it starts to run off. Um, and so you can be a, a better fertilizer applicator by using uh, organic fertilizers that are not uh, not synthetic and don't you know maybe come from uh, uh, as a byproduct of another industry, um, but you're still putting a pollutant down that's still going to uh, impact streamways, uh, uh, excuse me, waterways and streams. Um, in the Northeast, we'll always have to apply fertilizers. Part of that is because our soils tend to be on the acid side, um, and turf grass really doesn't like uh, acid soils for the most part, and so we have to compensate with. Uh, with chemistry. Um, in the U.S. we put about 3 million tons of fertilizer down on lawns across the country. Um, that's out of a total of 21 million tons of fertilizers that we apply. Again, <coughs> equating lawns with agricultural um, products. We, we spread a lot of fertilizer to grow corn um, and to grow food for people. Um, we spread, spread a pretty good amount of fertilizer out on lawns just to keep them green. Um, and uh, there are newish fertilizer regulations in New England, uh, so certainly here in Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, uh, I think Vermont. Um, these are uh, regulations that apply to every one of you who might happen to own a property, um, but very few people are aware of them. For example, you can no longer buy fertilizer um, that's got phosphorus in it uh, for treating your, your lawn. Um, so most of you might be familiar with the three numbers on a bag of fertilizer. That's NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, it's illegal uh, for you to apply phosphorus-based fertilizers on a lawn unless a soil test has told you that it's necessary. Um, and uh, yet it's not really in enforced, uh, not really regulated. But it is the reason that when you go to the hardware store now to buy a bag of fertilizer, it's really hard to find a bag that has um, phosphorus in it because of this uh, this plant nutrient uh, law that was passed back in 2012, I believe. Um, all of you should familiarize yourself with uh, the plant nutrient law. Um, if you hire a contractor to do your lawn care, um, they have to be licensed to apply fertilizers, just like they have to be licensed to apply pesticides. Um, but very few lawn uh, companies out there are actually adhering to the law, unfortunately. Um, but it's really meant to regulate this pollutant. Um, and hopefully the law gets a little bit more teeth and uh, gets a little bit uh, stricter. Connecticut law restricts nitrogen as well as phosphorus. Um, that's, that's really a, a major player in, uh, in pollution is, is nitrogen because it's free and floats around pretty easily. Um, and then finally, I, I want to mention a little bit about fossil fuels and emissions. This is actually an area where there's been a lot of improvement over the last several years. I'd say the last five or six years. Um, there's been a lot of improvement, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, 
But when you're running your typical lawnmower, you know, as a, as a uh, residential property owner, um, driving or ri running your mower for about an hour is about the equivalent of driving 100 miles in your car. Um, and I know that many people hang on to their lawnmowers a lot longer than they maybe should. Uh, and many people use, you know, gas from the previous year, um, or they're, uh, you know, uh, limping their, their uh, the motor of their lawnmower along. Um, it's probably spewing out a lot more uh, fossil fuel emissions, a lot dirtier emissions than a modern um, uh, gas, bone, gas burning mower would be. Um, so that number's probably worse uh, if your mower is, you know, maybe 10 years old. Uh, or, or more, um, and I just I, I found this statistic when I was putting this presentation together a while ago. I remember the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill, that major catastrophe um, that spilled about 11 million gallons of oil uh, off the coast of Alaska. Um, uh, someone actually did this research. We spill about 17 million gallons of gas just fueling up our lawn care equipment every year. Um, so just to put that into context, uh, that, that major catastrophe, 11 million gallons of oil being spilled into uh, the, the, uh, the, off the coast of Alaska, um, we spilled more than that in gasoline, the equivalent of gasoline um, every year just fueling up our landscape equipment. Um, so something to keep in mind. But as I mentioned, this, uh, this is one area where we've had a lot of great improvement over the last several years. Um, these are both electric mowers. So on the right is the mower that we use at, at Tower Hill. Um, that's a fully lithium uh, uh, running, lithium ion battery mower. It's a 48 inch uh, riding mower. Um, that's the only mower that we use on the property for mowing all of our um, uh, turf spaces. Um, on the left is a Husqvarna auto mower. Um, I know a lot of landscape companies are starting to adopt these auto mowers, uh, which I think is just a brilliant uh, business model for them. Um, every time they sign on a new uh, uh, garden maintenance client, uh, this one company in particular called NatureWorks, uh, they set them up with an auto mower. The auto mower is great. It runs at like 2 o'clock in the morning. No one has to be around to, uh, to pay attention to it. Um, it mows every single day. Um, a lot of them are solar charged. Um, but they keep your grass actually a lot healthier um, than the typical, you know, maybe twice a week or once a week mowing that a commercial landscaper would do uh, because they're just constantly keeping that grass at the right height. Uh, much easier to uh, deal with weeds in the lawn when it's being mowed every single day um, and, uh, and very little uh, carbon impact uh, because you're, you're mowing with electric. Um, so. It's a great way to go. They're a little on the expensive side. Um, we're looking to maybe put one in on one particular lawn that we have at Tower Hill, uh, more for demonstration purposes than for anything else. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great advancement. And I, I know a lot of you have been to the hardware store and seen um, electric mowers by companies like Ego, uh, Greenworks. Um, I bought an Ego at home a couple years ago, and it's been great. It's the only mower that I use. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, batteries charge up in you know 30 minutes, and I can run it for an hour. Uh, works extremely well for my purposes. And I also bought an electric snow blower that's made by the same company, um, so I do all my snow blowing with uh, with a battery operated snow blower too. It's two stage. Works really well in our climate with uh, with the, the snow that we get in the winter. Um, so I'm very excited about the electric um, uh, equipment that's available now. Um, and last year, uh, just to toot our horn a little bit, um, the Botanic Garden was recognized as the first, green, uh, the first certified green zone botanic garden in the country by an organization called the American Green Zone Alliance um, for our adoption of electric equipment. Um, we have electric blowers, electric string trimmers, um, electric mowers, um, and electric everything. This is definitely the way we're going. Electric chainsaws, we're really happy about the technology uh, advances. Um, and then I, I just want to, you know, before we move on to the next, uh, the next piece of the, of the talk, I just want to mention this a little bit. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the term invasive species. Uh, just show of hands if you've heard that term before. Uh, okay, so an invasive species is one that's been moved from another part of the world, brought into a, uh, an environment where it has few predators um, and uh, can really impact um, ecological, uh, or, or can really impact ecology in another part of the world. Um, and so let's just pick these definitions apart a little bit. Uh, NRCS is uh, National Resource Conservation Service, uh, uh, USDA 
Um, and they define an, an invasive plant species as one that is both non-native, so you know, from another part of the world, um, able to establish on many sites, grow quickly, and spread to the point of disrupting plant communities or ecosystems. Um, you know, I don't think there's more disruption uh, possible than uh, the typical managed manicured lawn. Um, and so I, I want us to start thinking in these terms uh, about, you know, every time you look at a large SUV driving down the highway, you think gas guzzler, you know, fossil fuels, uh, couldn't they do a better job of, uh, of, of buying a car that's not, you know, spewing so many emissions? I would love for people to think the same way when they see a big expanse of lawn uh, around someone's property. Um, this presidential executive order uh, defined uh, uh, invasive species as one that's, again, non-native uh, to the ecosystem under consideration and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause both economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Um, with the amount of money that we spend on lawn care, um, the amount of environmental harm that can happen from uh, fertilizers uh, leaching out into the greater uh, landscape um, and the amount of toxicity that's in a lot of the commonly used pesticides, um, I don't see how you can say uh, the typical American lawn is uh, any better than uh, an invasive species. So I just want to kind of leave you with that thought before we move on. Um, and then finally, as a, as a horticulturist, as someone who really appreciates landscapes, um, I just find lawns really boring. Uh, and I don't know why this has become the ideal, uh, because um, I think we're more creative as a people, uh, and uh, this does not scream creativity to me. So, all right. Hopefully you're uh, coming over to my way of thinking. Uh, let's talk about how we can sustainably rid ourselves of lawns. Uh, because the last thing I want you to do is go out um, and just nuke your lawn with pesticides because uh, that maybe defeats the purpose. Um, so we're going to talk about a few different ways that we can rid ourselves of lawn um, uh, and we'll go through each of these in a little bit of detail. Um, first is solarization. This is a great con conversation starter with your neighbors, um, but it's, uh, it's a really simple, um, very passive uh, way to, to rid yourself of lawn and it just involves burying it in clear plastic, um, taking advantage of the power of the sun to essentially bake uh, what's beneath it. Um, this is a great way to kill off just about any uh, vegetation um, in an area. This was uh, a project we were working on at Garden in the Woods uh, where we were trying to rid ourselves of some um, uh, colonizing non-native species in a, a garden that we were renovating. Um, and so we solarized it for a full season. Um, it's really important that you do this in full sun. This is not a method that will work well um, in a shady uh, backyard because you're really relying on the power of the sun to do the work for you. Um, it's important if you're doing this on a lawn um, that you mow it first and then water pretty heavily because what you're actually doing is causing steam pasteurization. You're, you're causing steam to build up um, underneath that, that clear plastic. So you want to make a very tight seal with the plastic, make sure the edges are buried, um, make sure all that heat and all that humidity stays right there underneath the plastic. Um, it does take about six weeks to fully kill off turf grass. Um, a question that I get pretty often from people who are uh, mindful of soil microorganisms is what happens to soil microorganisms? Um, and a lot of soil microorganisms are pretty tolerant of uh, extreme temperatures um, and they will, uh, they will rebound. Um, but you can also add some compost after you've completed solarization uh, to sort of re-inoculate your soil with uh, soil microbes. Um, so this is a very effective, um, really sustainable way uh, to rid yourself of lawn. Um, it does take time um, and you will have a plastic lawn uh, in front of your house for a while. Uh, but it is, as I said, a great conversation starter. Um, next is mechanical. Um, this is probably the most labor-intensive method for removing a lawn. Um, it's very quick, uh, but it does lead to some disturbance, which might actually encourage weed seeds to grow. Um, it's really important if you're doing mechanical removal of, of a lawn that you remove the crown. It's not enough to just kind of shave that lawn down with a string trimmer or a mow at a really low height. Um, you've got to make sure that you're removing the growing point um, and removing some of the, uh, some of the root system of the lawn as well. Um, most hardware stores will rent a sod cutter, and a sod cutter is really just a machine that vibrates a bunch, has a sharp blade on it, gets underneath your grass, 
um, and we'll just uh, lift it up as you go. Uh, it's really easy to strip off like, you know, eight, you can just pull off like 18 inch strips of lawn uh, pretty quickly. You do have to figure out what to do with the uh, strips of grass after you've removed them, uh, but they compost, they compost pretty well. So it's not, not hard to figure out what to do with it. Uh, but that disturbance can lead to uh, weed germination. Um, and uh, it's also going to instantly remove any vegetation. So if you get a rainfall or heavy winds, immediately after you've removed your, uh, your lawn this way, um, you will lose some soil um, to erosion. So it's important that you think about um, this as a, as a two-step process. First is removing the lawn. Um, second is planting whatever it is you want to plant um, so that you can get mulch down and you can start to get some root growth um, to hold on to your soils before they erode. Like I said, it's, it can be backbreaking. You can also do it with a with a shovel, with a fork, uh, but I recommend using a, a sod cutter. Um, if you haven't run a sod cutter before, it's, it's great to have that experience. Uh, and uh, like I said, you can find them pretty easily at a local hardware store. Um, next is chemical. And so for as much as I've harped on uh, the harmful effects of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, chemicals, of, of pesticides, sometimes this could be the most sustainable way to rid yourself of lawn. Um, and I say that because you might not uh, be able to do solarization. You might have a shady spot and the solarization is really not going to work for you. Um, you might not be able to rent a sod cutter and do that back-breaking labor, labor of uh, mechanical remover, removal. Um, and honestly, uh, a, a one-shot application of an herbicide um, can be a really effective way to, uh, to instantly kill off a lawn. Um, this can be really quick uh, and, uh, and a single application of an herbicide is uh, is, is not going to have as much impact as that lawn continuing to grow there and be managed um, would. So, you know, don't, uh, don't completely eliminate um, herbicide removal from your, uh, from your arsenal. Um, you want to make sure to use a broad spectrum herbicide if you are going to do this. Um, and I just want to say a few words about uh, organic herbicides versus uh, synthetic herbicides. So many of you are familiar probably with um, Roundup, uh, which is you know one of the most commonly uh, used herbicides on the planet. Um, Roundup has recently been linked to different forms of cancer. Uh, certainly, a, 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 a chemical that we all need to be very careful in working around. Um, but so are a lot of organic herbicides. So just a couple of examples here: clove oil um, is a commonly used organic herbicide. Um, it's also a known carcinogen. So just because it's organic doesn't mean it doesn't have human health impacts. Um, we still have to take precautions. We still have to be very careful about using any chemical, whether it's organic or not. Um, and then acetic acid, which is highly concentrated vinegar, um, that has a lower LD50 than glyphosate. So LD50 is the lethal dose it takes to kill off half a population. Um, and so if uh, glyphosate is um, is spoon-fed to mice, let's say, in a lab, um, well, acetic acid will kill those mice much quicker um, than glyphosate will. So it's not only uh, do you find um, uh, acute toxicity, you also find uh, long-term toxicity uh, in organic herbicides. So just be careful when you're choosing one um, that you're not just saying, oh, it's organic, it's safe, because that, that's, uh, that's, that's definitely not true. Um, but chemical removal can be really quick, uh, and, and, it, and it can actually be pretty sustainable um, if you do it right. Um, another method is uh, smothering or sheet mulching. Um, some people you'll hear this referred to as lasagna mulching. Um, and so this is really simple. Um, you can either say, you know what, I, I can't solarize. This is a shady spot in my yard. Uh, but I can certainly lay down some landscape fabric. Um, that will over time kill off the lawn that's beneath it. Um, I will say that's going to take a long time. Uh, without the benefit of sunlight and that uh, solarization method, um, you really need to leave a landscape fabric down for quite a while before it'll uh, totally kill that lawn. Um, think like six months to a year. Um, but you can also um, uh, think about doing this in a slightly different way, um, using either a thick layer of cardboard or a material like, that's called ram board. Ram board is like a flooring protector or a flooring underlayment. It comes in rolls at the hardware store. Um, it's thicker than paper, um, not quite as thick as cardboard, um, but will break down over time. It's organic, it'll break down, it's just wood fiber. Um, and I've seen a lot of people say, you know what, this weekend I'm killing my lawn and I'm planting a new garden um, by 
planting shrubs, uh, rolling out ram board, and then burying the ram board in a mulch. Um, works really well, and there's really no harm in doing that. Um, you might, if you don't cover every single bit of that lawn um, with ram board, you might find that you've got some escapees that come up um, in and around the sort of corners and stuff, but, um, but it does really work well, and it's a great way to build soil. Um, so if you've got an area that you're not intending to plant right away, you can lay ram board or cardboard or a thick layer of newspaper down, um, pile it up with organic materials, maybe some compost, maybe some wood chips, uh, maybe some leaf litter, uh, whatever you might have on hand um, that's organic, let that material break down, and then within a year or two years, you'll have a nice rich soil that you can plant directly into. Um, so this is probably the most passive most sustainable way that you can uh, rid yourself of lawn. Um, you just have to have some patience. It's a very slow method. And then finally, there's just benign neglect. Uh, this is no mow May. Um, so there's no harm in just saying, you know what? I'm not going to mow my lawn ever again. Uh, forget May. Let's just always uh, say no mow. Um, right. So there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, just stop mowing and see what happens. Um, I think a lot of times what you'll find if your lawn has been artificially propped up with uh, fertilizers and, the, and a lot of chemicals, um, you'll find some really interesting things will happen. Um, but you'll also find that now there's some interesting plants that grow up um, as, a, as I'm allowing my lawn to go. Um, if you find that you've got problematic weeds, you know, a, a weed issue that I have in my uh, home landscape are, are different thistles. Um, thistles have sharp thorns. My daughter is always barefoot, um, so she steps on a thistle and you know screams at me. Um, so those are you know removed, uh, whether that's mechanically uh, or or with an herbicide. Um, so you can spot treat those issues. Um, if you've got some invasive species that might move into your uh, newly growing meadow, uh, there's lots of things you can do to manage individual species before they grab a foothold. Um, and then it's always good to uh, so, sort of seed in desirable plants things that you would like to see in your newly growing meadow. Um, and I would recommend a resource. Uh, there's a, a nursery called Prairie Moon. Um, that's probably one of the better retail <coughs> nurseries where you can buy uh, native wildflower seeds. You can buy uh, native plant plugs. Um, and they have a great selection, uh, really good resources on their website for selecting plants. Um, you can buy mixes. Uh, I bought a mix called Pollinator Palooza a few years ago. Uh, so if you're interested in pollinators, you can plant a pollinator garden um, pretty easily just by buying some seed um, uh, from a place like that. Um, but there, there are you know, plenty of plants that you could plug into a, a newly growing meadow um, that will be able to uh, compete with the grass as you sort of let it go, make it a little bit more interesting. Um, and you can definitely plant perennial plugs. When I say plugs, Plugs are like smaller than a one quart pot. Um, and there are a lot of companies now that sell plugs. So you can buy a plug tray of uh, 50 plants. Um, and they're you know, really small. They're about five inches deep, about two inches wide. Um, established very quickly. They've got deep root systems. Um, and it's definitely the way to go if you're looking to plant a lot of the same uh, perennial is to buy plugs. And Prairie Moon sells them different times of the year. All right. So you've rid yourself of your lawn, and now you're uh, trying to figure out what to do next. Um, so a couple words about uh, plants, selecting plants. First, you always have to make sure you understand what your garden has to offer before you bring a plant home. Um, it's not enough to say, I saw this plant. It's got blue flowers. I'm a sucker for blue. Uh, I've got to have it in my garden uh, because that plant might want shade. It might want sun. It might want wet. It might want dry. Um, you've got to really know what your garden has to offer before you bring a plant home. Um, make sure that you understand what your soil type is. You know, is it well drained? Is it kind of um, heavy clay? Does it retain a lot of moisture? Is it impossible to keep it wet um, because it drains so well? Um, what kind of water resources do you have? So do you back up to wetlands like I do? Is it generally pretty wet near the, near the wetlands? Um, how close are you to wetlands? Should you be planting in the area that you're looking to plant this garden? Um, are you within the buffer zone, right? Um, and, uh, and how much sun do you have? Uh, do you have enough sun to support the plants that you're trying to grow? Um, really make sure that you understand what your garden has to offer uh, the plants that you're trying to grow before you bring them home. Um, and then find plants that suit your site. Um, so it's very important um, to match the cultural conditions that exist in your garden um, with the plants that you're trying to grow. 
a lot of times the difficulty that people have in keeping plants alive um, is just planting the wrong plants in the, in the wrong place. Um, so really make sure you understand what your garden has to offer before you bring plants home. And then fi find plants that'll thrive once they're established without a whole lot of help from you. Um, there's always a plant that'll work well. I like to say that um, if you don't plant something, nature will. Uh, and you know the, the, uh, the uh, weeds in our garden are a true testament to the resilience of nature. Um, uh, plants will grow if you don't plant something. So uh, there's always a plant that's going to do well, no matter how difficult the spot might be. Um, I like to advocate for using native plants. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I also want to make sure that people understand what a native plant really is. So generally speaking, native plants are those that existed in a given area uh, without human introduction. So it's a plant that grew someplace naturally uh, without being transported there by, uh, by you know, maybe in our case, uh, European settlers without, uh, without being transported to an area. Um, so think about you know, plants as being native to a particular place, not necessarily to a particular time uh, because um, migration and uh, succession uh, continues to happen. And there are great plants that are native a little farther south of us um, that are migrating northward that we should welcome. Um, and they're invasive species from other parts of the world um, that really we shouldn't be welcoming. Um, for our purposes, we're going to say native plants are those ex that existed in the eco regions of New England without human introduction. Um, so basically to sum up, native plants are those that were here um, long ago uh, and thrived. Um, so they naturally adapted to grow in our climactic conditions, our soils, uh, and, um, and there's a lot of reasons to use them. Um, first off, uh, if you're using native plants, if you've properly sited them, if you've planted them in a place where they would naturally grow on their own, um, they shouldn't need fertilizer, they shouldn't need any irrigation. Once they're established and they've got a good root system to grow on, um, they should do perfectly fine in your garden without a whole lot of help from you. Um, native plants are really critical habitat for uh, native pollinators and other wildlife. Um, there's a book called Bringing Nature Home that was written by a guy named Doug Tallamy back almost, gosh, 20 years ago now. Um, and what Doug Tallamy's book really showed is that um, if you want butterflies, this is one of the things that Doug Tallamy's book showed, if you want native butterflies, things like monarchs uh, in your garden, then you've got to have host plants. And host plants are those that the caterpillars can feed on. And a lot of our native plants um, support those uh, important insects. Um, and who eats insects? Everybody else, right? <laughs> Birds especially. Um, but yeah, uh, it, looks, it looks like Holly eats insects too. Um, but insects are great. Um, and uh, and uh, they support a lot of uh, native wildlife. Um, birds, uh, so our native birds um, feed a, uh, their young a diet of about 93% insects. Um, so those insects are really critical to supporting uh, native birds. Um, and planting native plants helps support native insects, helps support native birds. Um, I always, I really like this one. Native plants help to establish a unique sense of place. Remember the first couple of images I showed you of the you know, suburban uh, house lot with the island of mulch and a couple of trees and a sea of lawn? Um, where do you think that picture was taken? Anywhere. Well, Anywhere Arizona. Arizona, right? <laughs> yeah. You have no way of knowing because there's nothing that gives you any context. Um, so here in New England, uh, what's, what's one of the iconic landscape features in New England? Not a plant. Maple trees? The ocean's a good one. Rocks. Stone walls, Rocks, right? Rocks. Stone walls. So I lived in the mid-Atlantic for 10 years, and I really missed stone walls going through the woods. Uh, that's just an iconic part of the New England landscape, right? Um, what is a plant? Uh, what's an iconic plant of the New England landscape? I heard someone say one hostas. earlier. Uh, <laughs> not thinking hostas, um, but maples. Uh, so hostas. what do people like to do in the fall uh, in New England? They like to go and look at, look at leaves, right? Um, so we get, we get hordes of tourists from all over the world um, who come and visit us in the fall, primarily to look at plants, right? They're here to look at the leaves. Uh, so we have a lot of great native plants with very colorful um, um, foliage in the fall. They're well adapted to our area, but it's, you know, there, there are some key species, high bush blueberries, sugar maples, um, some of the oaks that are really iconic uh, parts of the New England landscape 
Um, and they really give us that unique identity. That fall color is something that people from outside this region are jealous of. Um, they're jealous of our plants uh, because they're so fantastic in the fall. Um, so that's what I mean when I say um, native plants help to establish that unique sense of place. Um, a lot of them are really beautiful. And then finally, they're adapted to our climate, soil, water, and ecology. Um, what I'd like to do now is just go over a very short list of uh, some of my favorite lawn alternatives. I mentioned this one earlier. This is wild strawberry, Fregaria virginiana. So this is a native plant that forms a dense colony of foliage, um, or a, a dense mat of foliage. Um, looks like a typical garden strawberry, uh, but the fruit on it is uh, only about this big. It's really small. Um, incredibly flavorful, packed full of uh, sugars. Um, wild strawberry uh, is aggressive. It'll colonize an area very quickly. It'll grow in very poor soils, grow with very little uh, tension. Um, so if you're really serious about a lawn alternative, this is a great plant for you. Um, and if you're, if you're honest with yourself about what you're using your lawn for, um, this is a nice green carpet. Gets great white flowers. It's blooming at, in my garden right now um, at home. Um, and I know this is a plant that my, my daughter is going to pick all the strawberries off before I get to them in June. Um, but it's, uh, it's, they're great tasting and a, and a really good lawn alternative. Only gets about, you know, yay big. Um, we had a, a strawberry lawn at Garden in the Woods. Um, we held an event every year uh, in the middle of June. Um, and it was beer and, you know, wine and cheese and uh, people picking strawberries from the ground and eating them um, as they were as they were enjoying the night um, and you know we used the lawn we used the strawberry lawn for that event because we knew it could tolerate some foot traffic and people would just walk all over it um, and and enjoy themselves um, this is a, a native grass called purple love grass aragras despectabilis um, this one uh, if you've driven down to the cape in july uh, and seen that purple haze on the side of the highway um, this is the grass that you're looking at. So purple lovegrass looks like crabgrass, but it's a perennial. Crabgrass is an annual. Um, it uh, has a pretty wide leaf blade. Um, this is different from the turf grasses that we've talked about because this is a warm season grass. So this is at its best in the middle of summer in drought conditions. It's green and growing like crazy because that's, really, that's what it really likes. Um, it likes to grow in the middle of the summer. Um, these two work really well in, in combination with each other. Um, we had an area, again, a garden in the woods uh, where we planted wild strawberry and purple lovegrass and just let them kind of duke it out. Um, the wild strawberry won that battle, but the purple lovegrass was really beautiful uh, sort of every other year when we managed it a little bit better. Um, this is a plant similar to wild strawberry. This is GM frigarioides. Uh, this is another uh, dense mat forming perennial. Um, has a, a flower that's similar to wild strawberry, but it's yellow instead of white. Um, does not produce fruit. That's why we call it barren strawberry. Um, does very well in, uh, in dry, uh, shady conditions. Will also do well in the sun. Um, has a nice glossy green foliage to it. It is um, uh, deciduous, so it'll die back to the ground in the winter, and then you'll get a new flush of foliage in the spring. Um, but what's nice about it is it does form a really nice uh, dense mat. Um, so it works very well to sort of colonize an area, um, keep back any weeds uh, that might come up once it's established. Um, and here growing the, at the base of this oak tree, you can tell it does well in you know, dry um, sort of acid soils. Um, this is probably the best lawn-like lawn alternative. This is Carex Pennsylvanica. Um, this is uh, Pennsylvania sedge. It's not a grass, it's a sedge, uh, but it, it's a graminoid or a grass-like plant. Um, uh, does flower, it's just finished flowering for us, uh, although the flowers are sort of unremarkable and you really have to be looking for them. Um, it does get very moppy like this, uh, especially if it's got a little bit of irrigation and some fertility. Um, this plant grows in the understory of like a dry oak forest, um, so it'll do really well in shade, do really well in dry soils. Um, most of the time when I talk to people about frustrations with their uh, turf grass, it's because they're trying to grow turf under trees. Um, and this is a, a grass that will grow under trees. Um, you know, don't do what my neighbor did and say, well, I can't grow grass, so I'm going to cut all the trees down. Um, just plant carrots, plants of Um we mow, this, uh, we mow this lawn once a year. Um, this picture was actually taken right before we mowed. Um, and because it's a carex and not a turf grass, 
really has a spring flush of growth and then it sort of slows down for the rest of the year. So you could mow it once a year and then never have to look at it again. Um, and it'll get shaggy in the spring, but then you mow it to a height of about six inches, maybe a little bit less. Um, and then it pretty much looks like turf grass for the rest of the year. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's definitely a good solution. Um, May I interrupt? Yep. So I have a push mower. Yeah. And I have to say a lot of the grasses will not get cut by that. And I probably need to sharpen the blades. Probably need to sharpen the blades. But the carriage Pennsylvania can be mowed with yes. a push mower. Okay. Um, so Garden of the Woods, we didn't have a, we didn't have a lawn except this. Uh, we mow this every year with a small push mower. When it gets real shaggy like that, it's better to bag it. Um, uh, but you know, I, would, I would mow this myself, and I'd usually mow it like in one direction, in the other direction, and then another direction, just to make sure that I got everything up and make sure I cut every single blade. Um, but it was fine with the push mower. Um, and if you're only mowing once a year, oh, it's I not that bad to have to mow it a few times to, to really finish up. Um, this is another grass. Uh, another warm season grass, so this is little blue stem, Schizocarium scoparium. This one gets about 18 to 24 inches tall. Um, so if you're really looking for um, something that looks a lot like a turf grass lawn, this is not the grass for you. Um, but it is one that will do really well on a dry uh, slope. Um, again, a lot of times when people are struggling with a lawn, it's because they're trying to grow grass in a spot where it's difficult to maintain. Um, my neighbor across the street, uh, has a very, very steep lawn, um, and I see him struggle. One of these days, he's gonna roll his mower over, um, and I'm gonna be calling, uh, calling an ambulance to, uh, to, to come and help him out. Um, if, if his lawn was all a uh, little blue stem, it would be a much, much easier thing for him to maintain. He wouldn't have to mow it all the time. Um, and this is a, a grass that does uh, really well in our climate. Um, again, doesn't get super tall, but about 18 to 24 inches in height, uh, and um, I don't have good images of it, but it goes through this progression of color change in the fall, where it starts off green, it's you know nice and green straight through the summer, um, but as it starts to sort of senesce in the fall, it turns kind of purplish, turns kind of silvery, and then finally this, uh, this nice rich brown for the winter. Um, and I, I like that as part of the uh, New England landscape to be able to see some of these tall meadow grasses popping up through the snow. Um, Another mat forming perennial is uh, Chrysogonum virginianum or gold star. Um, this is a, a tiny little aster um, that'll bloom from uh, say late spring, early summer into the fall. Um, has these little yellow flowers on it. Um, only gets about three inches tall um, and will spread and colonize. Does well in shade, does well in sun, does well in dry, does well in moist soils. Um, and it's a, a fantastic lawn alternative. Just uh, for lawn alternatives, I'm really looking for mat forming perennials. Um, something that can you know, colonize an area without a whole lot of uh, care and attention from me. Um, and so you'll find a lot of mine are, are, are like that. They're mat forming perennials. Um, this is a, a tiny little shrub, God bless you, um, called Sibaldia tridentata, the three tooth syncofoil. Um, this one is, uh, it's in the rose family, so the flowers look a little bit like an apple blossom. Um, again, only gets about three or four inches tall. Um, oh, shoot. My favorite picture of this plant is not in the slideshow, unfortunately. That's my fault. Um, in the fall, it turns this brilliant maroon color, um, kind of purplish maroon, and it keeps that color straight through the winter. Um, this one is very tolerant of uh, dry, sandy, gravelly soils and salt spray. Um, so I have this planted up along my driveway. Um, it gets hammered by salt all winter long and just doesn't care. Uh, it's evergreen, it's a nice flower, mine's blooming right now, um, and it will spread by seed. It'll definitely spread uh, rhizomatously. Um, it's a little, little tiny shrub, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great lawn alternative for, uh, for tough spots. You can see here, it's growing in the crack of uh, you know, granite crevice um, without a whole lot of moisture and doing just fine. Um, the serum canadense is wild ginger. Uh, this one is really for shady spots. Um, you can see what the foliage looks like in the, in the summertime. Um, unlike European ginger that's evergreen, this one is deciduous, which means it'll go dormant for the winter. So all the leaves will drop. Um, but in the spring, it puts out a, a nice early flush of growth. Um, the foliage looks like this as it's coming up, kind of folded before it opens up and lays flat. And it's this nice uh, sort of blue-green color. Um, and uh, the flower over here in the corner, you'll never see it unless you know what you're looking for and you get the time right. 
to lift up the leaves to really look down and, and admire it. It's, uh, it's more cool and, and, and interesting than anything else. Not particularly showy, um, but it's neat. This is a uh, running groundsel. This one's also called, called sneezeweed. Um, <laughs> Pacara obovata will not make you sneeze. Um, any, any flower that's attractive and uh, pollinated by bees um, is not gonna make you sneeze. The pollen grains are too big. They just don't act as an irritant. Um, what really bothers you, I know a lot of you are probably struggling with allergies or hay fever right now. It's the pines that are in bloom. It's the oaks that are in bloom. These are wind pollinated plants that produce an abundance of pollen that spreads around in the air. Um, it's why your car is covered in yellow uh, uh, when you go out in the morning. Um, but a plant like Pacara doesn't, doesn't produce a pollen that's carried by wind. Um, it's producing a, a, a pollen that's carried by bees. It's much heavier, um, so it doesn't actually cause you to sneeze. Um, same goes for um, uh, goldenrod, which I know a lot of people curse in the fall. Uh, and that doesn't cause hay, hay fever either. But Pacara uh, blooms um, early spring has purple foliage as it starts to come out. Uh, really lays very flat, colonizing, dense, dense colonizer. Um, and then blooms, uh, has these purple buds um, that you can see here that then open up to a yellow flower. They're really quite beautiful when they start to bloom. Just a few more here. This is Sporobolus heterolepis. Again, another grass uh, uh, that I think works really well as a lawn alternative. Um, so this is a, a lawn at um, a garden in Pennsylvania called Chanticleer. Um, they actually manage this with fire, so they burn this every single spring. Um, and this is a fire adapted plant, so it, it really likes that. Um, but you can see they have theirs uh, next to a, a, a traditional turf grass lawn with a lot of clover in it. Um, but the Sporobolus, I think, is, is just great. Again, like the little blue stem, I think will really work well on a slope. Um, you can neaten it up, you can mow it, you can uh, you know, cut it back with a weed whacker. Um, if you're so inclined, you can burn it. Um, but it's, uh, it's a really great um, lawn alternative. Uh, I see you shaking your head. Actually, like the fire department first. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, this is a plant I would not recommend anyone plant ever, um, but it is a very, very good uh, lawn alternative. This is hay scented fern, um, Denstadia uh, punctilobula. Um, and it's, uh, it's a plant for only areas where you want nothing but hay scented fern um, because it's such an aggressive um, colonizer. But it can really look quite beautiful. You can see it there in the, in the background. Um, and this is what Carrick's Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania looks like um, growing in oak uh, understory uh, in the foreground there. Uh, great alternative to uh, hay scented fern is Christmas fern. This is it, um, starting to emerge in the spring. Um, all ferns have a fiddlehead, um, but very few ferns are edible. Um, we have a fern in our native flora called uh, ostrich fern or fiddlehead fern. That's the one that you can eat, um, but you can't eat every fern, uh, fiddlehead, and you certainly can't eat these. Um, it's an evergreen fern, so it looks great in the wintertime with some snow. Um, and uh, again, as a lawn alternative, it's a mat forming perennial, forms a dense uh, uh, evergreen mat of foliage. Um, and for a shady spot that's pretty dry, I think it works very well. Um, this is another one I would uh, highly caution you uh, about. Anemone canadensis will, uh, it's a very aggressive spreader. Again, if you want a sea of anemone canadensis, then uh, uh, this is great. It's got good fall color, um, great white flowers, gets about 12 to 18 inches tall, um, but it will outcompete just about anything else that you try to grow. Um, so make sure that you only grow this in a spot where you want nothing but anemone canadensis. Um, a couple more, this is uh, bearberry, one of my favorite um, plant names to say is Arctostaphylos, uh, Uva ursi. Uh, this is, uh, uh, again, another really low growing evergreen shrub. Gets these fruit on it that look a little bit like cranberries. Um, it does very well in full sun, um, dry, sandy conditions, um, and does incredibly well in uh, areas that are inundated with salt. So it's another one that does very well along the driveway. Um, and then uh, Phlox de Vericata is uh, the blue flower that you see here. Um, this is uh, just, I think, one of those iconic spring combinations, Phlox and Tiarella, Phlox and Foam Flower. Um, if you have a, a shady uh, woodland area, um, I don't think you can do much better than Foam Flower. 
They're both blooming right now. They bloom right around Mother's Day. Um, I know a lot of a lot of moms probably got some flocks uh, as a gift over the weekend. Um, Phlox de Vericata is fragrant. Uh, it's a really beautiful fragrance. Um, Tiarella is not, but it has that, uh, that great sort of um, uh, delicate little flower that's, that's um, pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, and the Tiarella will show some nice color in the fall as well. And there's a ton of cultivars. There's one called Running Tapestry. It's a dense mat forming Tiarella um, that I, I, I know works very well as a long alternative. Um, and what's nice about foam flower is grow it from seed, every plant is a little bit different. Um, so this is all foam flower that was grown from the same seed source. And you can see how much uh, interesting character there is in the, in the foliage. Um, just contrast this with a lawn where every single blade is exactly yeah. uniform. Uh, I find this a lot more interesting. Um, and here's what it can look like in a, in a large landscape setting. Um, much prefer to see the Tiarella in flocks. Uh, as opposed to rolling hills of uh, turf grass. Um, and finally, uh, American lawns are wasteful, damaging, boring, and sterile. We can do a whole lot better than, uh, than the typical American lawn. Um, and I think it's really important to note this last point that our garden should really contribute positively to environment, environmental quality, and one easy way to do that is to kill your lawn. So, thank you. So uh, every single one of these is a fairly common garden plant um, with a couple of exceptions. Um, if you go to a nursery that specializes in native plants, they'll have most of what you saw. Um, the, the mail order nursery that I mentioned, Prairie Moon, definitely carries all of these plants. Um, but um, most of them you can find pretty easily in the spring. Um, you can definitely buy all these plants uh, at Garden in the Woods um, plant sales area. Um, so they have every single one of these species available for sale. Um, a lot of garden clubs will do native plant sales in the spring, um, so you can find, oftentimes find a lot of these plants at those native plant sales. Um, but yeah, that uh, prairie moon is probably the easiest source that I can think of for most of what you saw here. So. Is there any downside, as I found, <laughs> to uh, transferring milkweed? Um, so, no, not necessarily. I mean, milkweed, um, I would never bother transplanting milkweed uh, because it grows so easily from seed. Um, so, you know, collect seed in the fall, late summer, early fall, and spread that where you might want it. Um, so, yeah, you probably don't have to anymore, right? Yeah, I have tons of milkweed at home. Um, every summer we raise some monarch uh, caterpillars to butterflies. It's a great learning experience for my kids. Um, but you know, it's only because I have milkweed uh, all over the place. So, yeah. There's yeah. A, a new uh, native nursery. It's called Blue Stem Natives. It's in Norwalk. Yep. And they yep. have it's a uh, it was started by three women, and they do all native plants. Thank you for mentioning them because I I'm not in this area, but I know of them, so yep. that's great. Yeah. Great, yep. Great that's yep. great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah. So. I have kids at home, right, like yep. you said. Uh, and a lot of these seem like great options in the future. Sure. Less active on our lawn. Yep, yep. But three kids and a dog, I feel like none of those felt like a great option. Yep. And I guess what other turf-like alternatives are there? Yeah, so I, I practice the um, sort of difference between benign neglect and just kind of allowing things to happen. Um, so for example, uh, there's a plant called bugleweed or ajuga. Um, it's a pretty common like garden um, uh, uh, ground cover. Um, when I first moved into my house about 10 years ago, um, my, the previous homeowner had planted a lot of ajuga in some of the garden beds, and it escaped into the lawn. Um, and at first I thought, oh, I've got to you know, get the ajuga out of the lawn, but then I just kind of let it do its thing. And so now, 10 years later, I've got my whole entire front yard, uh, which is a fairly substantial front yard. It's, um, Right now, it's beautiful. It's all purple. Uh, the ajuga is blooming like crazy. Um, and it's an area that I don't have to mow a whole lot um, for the rest of the year uh, because the ajuga is one of these mat forming perennials. Um, it's a slope, so we don't really you know, do a whole lot out there. Um, but I've chosen that area to really kind of feature my approach to 
no mo may, uh, and also uh, my approach to just allowing nature to sort of run its course. Not a native plant, uh, but it certainly works really well and it's completely incorporated itself into the lawn. Um, but I also have, um, I've got a lot of, uh, I've got a lot of violets that grow naturally in my lawn. Um, if I seed, I always seed with tall fescue. Um, tall fescue is drought tolerant. It's, uh, it's uh, really doesn't require a whole lot. I, um, I had my, my septic system redone a couple of years ago. Um, and so that area I have to maintain in lawn and I, I wanna make sure I never have to replace my septic ever again. Um, so I'm being really careful about what grows on top of it. Um, and for that, it's all tall fescue. Um, tall fescue is you know, probably the best turf type um, uh, grass you can grow. Because it's so drought tolerant, it's more, drought, it's more tolerant of uh, the New England landscape than any other turf grass that's out there. Um, requires very little from you, um, except the occasional mowing. Um, and once you get it established, you really don't have to water it over the summer. Um, the mistake yeah. a lot of people make is growing um, Kentucky bluegrass, um, growing uh, rye, rye grass, like perennial rye grass. Um, so there are a lot of um, turf type grasses that look great as long as you're fertilizing them, as long as you're watering them. Um, and as long as you're applying lots of pesticides to them, but tall fescue is probably the best the best option. And that's mowable. And it's, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Turf yep, it's it's blended in most uh, most of the bags of seed that you buy have some element of tall fescue in them. Um, but when I buy seed, when I buy seed for Tower Hill, uh, when I buy seed at home, I I buy straight tall fescue. Um, I, mean, I threw clover down. Here. Clover's it's great. Yeah. Some places, yep. But we definitely have some patches. Of Yep. Yep. Children. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would definitely suggest using tall fescue. Okay. Yeah. The, the strawberry lawn. Once you get it going. Yep. How no maintenance or low maintenance? Yeah. So the occasional weeding, uh, walking across it and pulling out like a you know some grass that might grow up in it or some other weed that you might not want. Um, and then for for us, we would mow it once a year right after the strawberries were finished. Um, and so by mowing it, we would just encourage that flush of new growth to come out, um, kind of neaten it up a little bit. That honestly took care of most of the weeding that we ever had to do, um, but that was about it. That was really about it. Uh, was all we really had to do was just kind of mow it once a year. Never had to water it, never had to do anything else with it. Um, we honestly had to um, uh, manage around the edges uh, because we didn't want it creeping out into some of the areas that, uh, that, it was, uh, that surrounded it. Um, but it was it was incredibly low maintenance. So, um, yeah. Yep. Um, so what is what are your plans? What are the plans in the state of Massachusetts to change the mentality? I work for a fairly good-sized landscape company, yep. and when you suggest alternatives, they are not received very well. Um. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm the oddball. I'm like. Oh yeah. Bathhouse, you know, yep. Mosquito spray, and um, you yep. know, you need to put in native plants and more diversity. And um, grass is not native. Nope. And, um, you know, no one was a woodland at one time. Yeah. So how how do you go about changing the mental perception and culture? Uh, I I guess that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and but also you know like a place like Tower Hill. So I used to work at Garden in the Woods, um, and for those of you who visited Garden in the Woods, it, t it definitely is a very specific uh, subset of gardening public that uh, can appreciate and enjoy that type of landscape. Um, we have that type of landscape at New England Botanic Garden, but we also have a lot more formal garden spaces, um, and we manage our turf grass areas. Uh, we, you know, we host 40 some odd weddings every year, so that turf is really important for the wedding ceremonies that happen there, for the large events that we host, um, but we don't fertilize. Uh, we only irrigate in the worst of the drought situations or if we're renovating an area and need to germinate new seed. Um, we use, uh, thing, you know, we use co uh, compost applications. We tolerate a ton of weeds. Um, so if you, you know, visit the garden now, you'll see Creeping Charlie, you'll see a lot of uh, you'll see a lot of uh, clover. Um, you'll definitely see a lot of dandelions. Um, so we try to serve as an example of you can still have a lawn, but it doesn't need to be managed in the way that we've been managing lawns. Um, and it's a lot more sustainable than the than the typical um, uh, you know landscape service is offering. Um, and then we also try to 
do as much as we can to maintain it with uh, uh, electric equipment. Um, and you know, this is, it's a sea change and um, it's gonna take a lot of time, but it's about setting a better example. Um, and understanding that not everyone's gonna meet you at Garden in the Woods, um, but people will certainly meet you at New England Botanic Garden. And when they can visit a place like New England Botanic Garden and see that we're managing our spaces in a different way from the way that the you know, contractor down the street uh, or the office complex that's down the street, um, we're a lot more tolerant of, uh, of, of weeds. Um, and we're a lot more open to um, you know, different types of, uh, of management of our garden spaces. I think that's, that's how you change people's minds. So um, yeah, does that make sense? But I, I agree, it's very difficult, um, really, really difficult to do. Question over here. I have um, a question, but first I want to say that wildflowers, I have one whole section in my back, I don't plant in anything. Yep. Every color you want. That's they're great, weeds, yeah. They're gorgeous. Sure. Yep. But then I just found out by hearing the um, that milkweed, I thought that was a weed. It's for butterflies. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. Hole in it. Yeah. So anyway, the neighbor told me about that one. But what I do <coughs> have is a weed, and I know it is because I can't get rid of it. It grows 10, 12, maybe 12 feet high, and it spreads, and then it has these feathers at the top. Can't get rid of it. <coughs> feathers are like brown, like little feathers. It just keeps coming back. I pull the roots can be like this long, or yeah. how do you get rid of it? Uh, with, um, right. Without a picture, I can't really, um, yeah. I can't really tell what you're describing. It sounds like it is could it? be something like Phragmites, yeah. um, which is going to be really difficult. It's an invasive species and really it's difficult it's to. Seen um, a lot of times before swamp. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It sounds like Phragmites. Can't get rid so, of it. No, that's um, for something like Phragmites. You really need a professional um, because it's just impossible to. Eradicate, get rid of it. So, <laughs> it's yeah. come back again. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. tough. Um, yeah. Question. <laughs> I've um, tried a lot of plants we had out there. Yep. Um, and, and I think another name for those would be like, especially the suburban neighborhoods, rabbit heat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. what would you recommend of what you have in there? Honestly, most of what was up there is pretty rabbit tolerant. Um, I would shy away from Phlox and Tiarella because they're definitely going to get munched. Uh, so, much like foam flowers. So, so, yeah, foam flowers flower is a flower. favorite. Um, uh, Pacara, I would say you can get away with Pacara. Uh, that's the running groundsel. Um, it has those yellow flowers, and forms a nice dense mat. Um, some of the grasses will, you know, the grasses will tolerate uh, rabbits munching on them. So like purple up grass, um, rabbits will munch on it, but it doesn't really care. It's got an uh, intercalary meristem. So it's growing up from the ground as opposed to growing from the tip. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's not going to be a problem at all. Rabbits will help mow it down a little bit, but it won't really harm it, if that makes sense. Well, Carrots, um, Carrots Pennsylvania has been Same with Carrots Pennsylvania. But it, doesn't, yeah. but it doesn't spread, I think, because it gets munched. So um, I, I put it in the plugs. Yeah, I would. Five years later, it's just still a just a little plugs. That's why I was talking to you said about Canada anemone. I planted it two years ago, and there's four leaves there. Is that right? The rabbits just keep getting it. Yeah, it's. it's, it's uh, well, I find that I also find that city rabbits are different from country rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a friend, uh, I have a friend who lives in Worcester, and she's been she's lived there for five years, and she keeps trying to you know add new things to her garden. And everything that I suggest, she's like, nope, rabbits got it. And it's, uh, you know, all the lists are are incorrect when it comes to city rabbits, unfortunately. So uh, <laughs> it's okay during the year, but in the winter, gets I think they're hungry down. enough. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Unless it's tough. the deer, yeah. It could be the deer too. Yeah, yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Rabbits are difficult. I'd, I'd suggest an air rifle um, or, <laughs> <laughs> or, or cats. Oh, so, the cats are going to eat the birds. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, I'll, I'll take one more question. Uh, right there. Yeah. Um, what is best for, I'm in a condo. What is best for um, salt and sand in the wintertime? That will come back. So, you're so at, the trucks come, they yep. throw the salt in the sand. Yep. And I'm trying to grow so many things in yep. the condo. I finally got them to stop putting fertilizer down, which took me a lot of years. Yep. But they stopped putting fertilizer down. So, but now I've got a lot of, uh, uh, you know, dirt because yep. the salt in the sand just kills the grass, which is good. Yep. But the problem is now, where do I put it in? Yeah. So the, uh, the my favorite is that. Um, Three-tooth cinquefoil, the Sabaldia tridentata, 
Um, like I was saying before, I have that up at the top of my driveway, so it gets hammered with the, you know, the trucks, yeah, salt and sand coming by all the time, um, and it just doesn't skip a beat. Um, there's a, uh, so when I was at Native Plant Trust, we put together a searchable plant finder. Um, and so if you go on their website, you can find gar the garden plant finder. What's nice about it is you can select different environmental conditions, and you can select for salt tolerance, oh, and it'll give you a list of plants that are salt tolerant. Um, salt, salt moves really rapidly through yeah. soil. Um, so a lot of times where you run into trouble, it's plants that are actively growing or have foliage up above ground in the winter. Um, that are heavily impacted by it, um, but things that are dormant for the winter, um, uh, that you know, like a lot of perennials can grow in a in, in a hell strip because they're not really there. They're not impacted by the salt. It doesn't really have much of a residual that builds up in the soil and impacts plant growth later on in the season. Yeah, the um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but that's of all the opposites. It's great. It's evergreen. You know, turns a nice kind of purplish red in the fall. Um, stays that way all winter long. Um, blooms right now. It's a little tiny shrub, and I, I just love it for spots like that. And it's called? It's called Three Tooth Cincafoil. Uh, yeah, make it really easy to remember that one. Okay. Three Tooth Cincafoil. I know you're going to be tired, but before everybody gets out of here, you should know that MCM has filmed this presentation. So if you want to go back and see it so that you can remember some of these plants and some of the properties, you can stream it from MCM. You can watch it out on your computer or cell phone and go back and hear it. But uh, MCM will have it up. I don't know. I'm not sure you're going to do it. It's on the energy side. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have by email, too. We have a uh, really simple email. It's just plants at nebg.org. Um, so feel free to send any plant questions. Um, I monitor that email inbox. I will say right now, um, it's spring, and it might take me a little while to get back to you, but I, I will respond to all those. So uh, if you have a plant question, that's the best place to send it um, to us. So plants at nebg.org. Thank you. All right. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.